I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer Dorner and, and, and Sarah the gallery for, for their enthusiasm for this project. Yes, actually over a couple of years. Um, also, uh, uh, the Faculty of Fine Arts Dean's Office are very supportive of this project. And lastly, and uh, in some ways most importantly, uh, the Concordia Part-Time Faculty Association, who um, partially funded this project. They were the largest uh, contributor financially to this project. And so we have a, a union who also represents our um, uh, bureaucratic interests as part-time teachers, but also um, helps uh, the artists who are part of the part-time faculty here participate as, as creative people and researchers in the, in the creative life of this university. So that's a pretty important uh, thing. So thank you. So today I think we're, we're, we're each going to speak for uh, seven and a half minutes. <laughs> and um, like, what am I going to do? I'm on the other side of the table. Um, we're here to uh, maybe have a discussion about this, this piece, Paraguayan C, that is stretched around the outside of the building, this, this text piece, and also as time would have it, um, the launching of um, Aaron's translation of Wilson Bueno's Paraguayan C, which happens to be now um, <laughs> that this book has, has come out, so we can celebrate and discuss those two things. And I think um, when I think about uh, this project, um, a mutual friend of ours, Stephen Horn, um, wrote a short text about this piece that may appear somewhere sometime. But one line in this, in this, uh, in his text was, he, he described it as something about how we engage this piece as a practice of reading against proper meaning. So a practice of reading against proper meaning. And that sort of intrigues me as, as to what it is for me to borrow a text from Aaron, who has borrowed a text from Wilson Bueno, this text then, and this piece that has, um, well, three authors, and this piece that has five languages, and what is it, this process of translation and transformation, you know, what is that process that seems, I mean, I really love this piece, and I love it because it just keeps on producing in some way. Um, it keeps on going, and it's not a piece that I feel is my piece or is Aaron's piece, or it just keeps on going. So it's kind of a thing that I like about it. Um, to talk about some specific things about this text that stretches around the building, um, it's on this kind of threshold between indoors and outdoors, between an institutional space and a, a public space. And for me, it's kind of fascinating to see language that is not instrumental language take a place on this kind of membrane between institutional and public, between inside and outside, between what goes on in my head and what happens in the world when I speak words or write words or we speak or write words. So that's a kind of transformation, a membrane of transformation that I think is something that language does that really fascinates me and is interesting in this piece. And just to say something about the form of the piece, since I'm talking about a kind of transformation, we take this text, which is normally in the, in the form of a book, in the architecture of a book, in the ritual space of the book, or we take this text that's normally in the form or the format of the screen, and we take it and we stretch it out around a building. And what does that do to how we experience or read against proper meaning? And there's something about when I watch people engage with this piece that you can, you can start at the beginning and you can try and follow the text all the way around the building. And then you can get to the end of a line and you can walk all the way back around the building and try to get it again. So there's this kind of a longitudinal stretch of language that is different from the way we work with, read with uh, books. 
Or you can burrow into the language. You can stay in one place and go through that membrane into the imaginary space of the language. So the, 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 the proper meaning, which is a consecutive meaning, is, if I if go back to Stephen's phrase, it's not about reading against meaning. It's about reading against proper meaning. So it's a question of what's proper meaning. And these two stretchings and burrowings are, for me, part of that idea of improper reading. And then the last thing I'll say is something about the typeface. There is a typeface that was conceived. I don't want to use the word design, but made. It was made for this piece. And if we think about typography as a part of creating proper reading, that a serif typeface is designed to allow us to move from letter to letter, from word to word, from phrase to phrase, from line to line, to, to create that fluidity. This typeface with its kind of spikiness and growths and protuberances and hooks um, is, um, I can show you. I like being able to bring words, words into the room, like carrying a piece of plywood. Oh, this one's gone. Looking for some better words. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, this is like the experience when I would go to his studio and see where he was out. <laughs> <laughs> <Really good. laughs> but, but when, when I think about this typeface, there's nothing special about this typeface. When this is the second version of this piece that Aaron and I have done, and the typeface was kind of conceived and made in a week. And, but what this typeface does for me is it's like, um, you know, when you're walking in the fall and in, in the woods and there's those seed pods on plants like burrs and so on. For me, the typeface is like burrs. That they, it gets caught, you get caught on the letters. You get caught on the curves of the letters. You get caught on the words. And they stick to you in a different way than the, the free flow of a proper serif readable Times New Roman, which is what this typeface is, is based on. So there's a, something about the physical transformation that, that operates with, with um, the materiality of the text and stretching it around the building. Comes back to, if, you know, if we're setting up for a conversation, what is a practice of reading against proper meaning? And um, I kind of love that relationship of this text, which is not an instrumental text, which is not a text about declarative prose. I mean, it's very hard to say what this text means when you walk around this building or what the content of this piece is, but it's a, a very active thing. And I'm going to stop and then Aaron continue. Thanks, Andrew. It's been, uh, for me, it's been a, a pleasure working both on the first iteration about four years ago now, I guess, and, and on this iteration of the of the text, I, I, um, I mean, basic, basically, the text does come from from this book, which I'll talk about in a in a moment, which I've been translating since two thousand and three. So actually, seeing the book is for me like, <laughs> um, and uh, well, just seeing the text too, seeing text from the book and written large and put on the on the outside of a building as if it's speaking to the street. It's kind of a noisy text, even if it's it's hard to read it because it's got this hyper serif font. And um, but it's it, it's like speaking to the street, which is already a noisy place. And it's kind of a noisy text on its own in a way. And it's uh, I, I kind of like the way it insists itself into the street and into the, the flow of what might be going on in the street. Uh, in Brazilian, the book, the original book, Mar Paraguay, insists itself into the, the street, the speaking street of, uh, of Brazilian literature, in effect. 
It's a book that was written not in uh, Portuguese, but in Portunol, which is a border mixture of the Spanish and Portuguese that's uh, very common, spoken uh, and used in the western part of Brazil, where Brazil meets Argentina and Paraguay, which is where uh, Wilson grew up. And it's, uh, it's also infected or interpelled or brought together with many, many words from Guarani, which Guarani is one of the more commonly uh, spoken lang uh, indigenous languages of South America. It's the one with the greatest percentage of non-indigenous speakers because it's co-official in Paraguay. So kids learn it in school. Um, and so that, that, that's part of it. As well, the title Paraguayan Sea, it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems paradoxical because Paraguay is landlocked. But uh, that's only to um, white people that it's landlocked because all the rivers that, uh, in the indigenous culture, all the rivers that go out to the sea mean that the sea, there's, the sea is there. Whack. The sea is, uh, <laughs> the, the sea comes all the way to Paraguay uh, just because of the, of the, of the great rivers. Um, as well, the, the the story takes place in a beach resort in Brazil on the east coast, as far away from Paraguay as you can get, uh, on where there is in fact a river that comes out that starts off in Paraguay, but it's it's a beach resort called Guaratuba, and it's um, it's called as a kind of joke Mar Paraguayo because so many Paraguayans come to take their vacation there, so people call it Paraguayan Sea. Anyways, so this book it's written in. A, a border language that's composed uh, very, in a very unruly and in unsystematic fashion of Portuguese and Spanish, and I had to figure out how how am I going to translate this? And so I kind of um, I was first asked in 2003 by Cecilia Vicuña, the Chilean uh, artist, who is one of the co-editors of the Oxford Book of Latin American Verse, if I would translate three pages of it so that they could put it in the, this book, and they found me because. They thought I would be willing to do something that's not very possible. And so I translated it into a kind of mixture of languages in my place, French and English. But it had to be, it's not like Franglais, because it's for English speakers. So it has to be comprehensible to English speakers, and especially in the USA, where there's less French, I've noticed. Um, it has to be, at least, it can be mysterious, but they still have to be able to read it. So that there's many more, I use a lot of uh, words that are the same in English or French. And uh, so you can read them in French if you like, or in, in English. And then there are some French words as well in the mixture. Um, I did notice that when, I, when Andrew created his banner we, and he had taken some text from the book, I thought, well, there's not enough French here when I saw it in Montreal, you know, envisioned it in Montreal. And so the text that is on the wall of the building is not exactly the same as the text of the book, because I put more French in it. <laughs> Just because it, that kind of a surface is more uh, readable to, uh, to, to Montrealers. Anyways, just, I, I was going to read a bit of it, but I have to stand to read. Because I, so I will the, make no mistake, Guarani is, essential, is as essential to this story as the flight of the bird, the speck on the window, the cooing of French, or the cascade of Neruda-esque outpourings in a single sur suicide of capacious English words. One's the error of the old. Maybe I wanted at times to end up ingesting in this zoo of sing the essential curl of sensation in the tail of the scorpion. Just this, I was désirant of all that vibrates and buzzes beneath, far beneath, the ling, the silence. Il n'y a pas de langage, non, only the vertige, the language. It tells me I exist. And because of this, I will shunt my marathon of floozy song aloud along the beaches of Oratuba, forbidden by the old guy who drags his butt around the house like a pale being gone cold, suffering the old guy's acts as necessary evil, never killing him despite my efforts to endure nights and days of pure abuse in a macabre obsession with tricking his grizzled neck skin. No, believe you me, I speak truly. I didn't kill the oldie. And then there was the boy, with his thighs clenched hard, concocted strength of men in his shoulders and in the obsessive meat of his sex, with which obsessively he seeks and hunts me, 
be his prisonier and chasseur. Nay, I'm the catin trollop of this beach town, a marathon of floozy. You see, in Guaratuba, I survive by my wits. Ah, and my happiness is devin before the sun, that crystal ball chargé with the future like a bomb that would explode the uranium of the day. I see the sea, mère la vie that je porte on my back, like a madame trained dame trust struck up to the guillotine. Oh, God have it. Why, there's God and there's my gob. What can anyone do? Today, I see myself in the eye beam of his dead year, that man who made me jitter like castanets between the sheets, who made me souffrir, who made a me qui m'a construit out of agony and blood, the blood drip shed by my bitter life. From his shoulders, my destiny, like a fate fet with a dagger in the right shawl of the heart. Right this minute now, I'm gobsmacked in front of his grim face, sunken red eyes, those eyes that were my eyes. No, I didn't kill him because his V was caught up on mine. It was destiné pure, I tell you, my fortuitous divination of la droit and meteoroid and crystal bomb. Avant tout, I saw him plus mort que la dead. <laughs> I was born deep in the deepest rural depths of my country, <coughs> on a Guarani ranch, all Guarania and solitude. The first time I approché the sea, there was only sea in sight of sea my gaze so charged with waves and bloom. Besides, I carried deep in one entirely other chanson stuck in the elevator, despair, suicidal desperation and sourness. My body gone flaccid from being cooped up in that dark room where je trace le destin or the fate of the man whom my hands will fini par suavely assassinating in the guise of a swan or sword. Or was it him who just upped and died? It was très simple. I just grabbed him unawares in a moment de distraction with the malevolence inherent in my being, in being his attendant and obligatory esclave. Je l'ai jeté on the sofa avec terreur et fear, strangely muet et dans une solitude de peu. No drip of blood to cause me problem, no pas une seule goutte. At night, I have my emploi. It's not that I fall in love. No, that's not it. What I have to say is such a labyrinth of spidery webs that spin high in the corners of the house, while I lounge in front of the television watching Sonia Braga in the sofa <coughs> of Gabriella. Her thighs give me goosebumps whenever they appear on screen, as if they were the ultimate aim of a life, my life. Life, or oh life on the fly. Each time I dream more and more of Braga, that's Sonia of my floozy life. Ah, here in the beach town of Guaratuba, there's nobody, personne, who speaks my langue, apart from the heavy silence of siestas calcinated by the height of summer, with cicadas agonized from singing and wee birds and the flamboyant treetops all giddy with lété, giddy laughter of pink dogwood beside the hibiscus that tells me it's already trop tard, it's already si tard to be dying. What an idea, what a crazy idea. J'oublie déjà, forgot to tell you, sir, of the sole companion who lets me state unerringly that all this is as real as a hibiscus. My dog, my teensy weensy pup, who answers to the sound of bricks. It is so teeny tiny, a fur ball, furry on top, as if he were a bifurcated comma on the move. Now for the, the drama, and yaretta, and yaretta, me qua. So I could go on. But, uh, <laughs> see, it's a murder <laughs> It's also, yeah, it's kind of a murder mystery, but it's also, there's also little excerpts or salutes or pointings or indications towards other works of Brazilian literature. So it, it's also acts as a kind of uh, a homage to reading itself and to literature to help us. Uh, Deal with life. <laughs> Thanks. Now I feel like I've, uh, I've experienced at least three versions of this book because reading it and then seeing it outside and then hearing it, it's, it's a completely different <laughs> performance. 
just goes of the word. On yes, it's it's endless. It's endless. So I just have a few comments that I've written um, that have to do with translation because that's um, what I do. So I will just read those comments. Sometimes I feel I spend my whole life rewriting the same page. It's a page with essay on translation as the topic. And then quite a few paragraphs of good, strong prose. These begin to break down toward the middle of a page. Syntax decays, perforations appear. By the end, there's not much left, but a few flakes of language roaming near the margins, looking as if they want to become an art of pure shape. I could have written that, but I didn't. <laughs> That's a quote from the poet and translator Anne Carson, who has many interesting things to say about translation, and whose essays do indeed go this way and that, not breaking down, as she claims, but going off in different directions. The topic of translation does that. It takes you different places, invariably stimulating places, I think because translation leads you to see things from a different angle. It's all about what is both the same and different <coughs> at the same time. Anne Carson has lots of images that try to capture that. A sensation of veils flying up, she says, or trying to see into the cracks in the ice, or the place before the zero, or the future underneath the past. I often think of Erin Murray and Anne Carson together as poets who love the way translation can be used as a way of experimenting with new forms, as a way of getting closer to work they admire, and at the same time having a lot of fun. Erin has written a number of blogs on translation, and one of my favorites is the one where she explains that her fascination for learning languages came from her childhood reading of the Ape to English Dictionary found at the end of Tarzan books. But she gives plenty of other insights into the way languages fit or don't fit into each other. And her dialogue with the Galician poet Shus Patos, of which you have some examples in some books over there, um, is a pretty great illustration of that. The multilingual mixophoning of the Paraguayan Sea is a happy addition to Aaron's many previous translation escapades. One that combines homage and admiration for the exuberant Wilson Bueno with at home Montrealish franglais language blending echoing his Portugnol, and still leaving plenty of room for guest appearances from Guarani. Aaron will already have mentioned, but he didn't, so I will mention that in her preface she says she wanted to use Mohawk in a first version, then determined the essential presence that Guarani, as she read, was an essential presence, and maybe she'll want to explain that later, because it would have been a possible choice to use um, an indigenous language from here as a um, corresponding language to Guarani, but Erin had reasons why she decided not to do that. We can see what this looks like with Andrew Forster's ribboning of the text along the St. Catherine Mackay, the prickly font accentuating the strangeness of language itself. As is to say, along with Nestor Peronier, who writes the introduction to the Paraguayan Sea, everything's the same, yet subtly all is altered. The event pokes holes kind of a, there's a poking holes in there, in that haunt, in our habits, and in the rhythms of the cosmos. The strangeness is intensified by the presence of Orani, the haunting repetition of words, the unusual accents adding to the visual disturbance, and reminding us here, if need ever there was, that language is a force forever shaping our being, that the city is a creation of language because to read its structures, the structures of the city, the buildings, the circulation of things within it, we need a language or maybe even two or three. The city doesn't look the same depending on which language is used to read it. 
Or perhaps we need to create special mixed languages to enter into the always changing vocabulary of the city itself. Erin Moray specializes, I would say, in the creation of such languages. <coughs> Not just mining the particular resources of the dialogue between French and English that exercises us in the city, but bringing in other histories from that other language border, the one that runs between Spanish and Portuguese, and includes Galician and here Brazilian Paraguayan Portuguese in a version that is enriched by a joyous poetic tradition. Wilson Bueno's mixolated Baroque is a creation of languages holding a mirror to the democracy and proliferation of languages. A homage to Joyce and Neruda, migrancy and geographical indetermination. Paraguayan C makes me excited about Wilson Bueno. I want to read all his work. And to, keep, and to keep reading this short, intense fable of riverations, Aaron's word, this literal page turner, which obliges the reader to refer to the Guarani glossary at the back. It makes me excited too about the process that put the book in my hands, the new iteration of the tale that I read in a disorienting sort of English. One that doesn't mimic any realistic version of Joie, as Aaron said, but following cues from Wilson Bueno, invents a new relationship between the two languages, one where French expressions and Guarani appear with some regularity, but never in any predictable way. And contributing to the impression that the story is really, after all, as much about language as it is about the marathon of Floozy and whether he, she did or didn't off the old man. This is Aaron Moray's kind of writing, a marvelous, multiphonic, mixolated word creation that emerged from the tides of the Panama Sea, now having come to mingle with the streams of the mighty St. Lawrence. Because of friendship, because of love for language, because of a Galician past, because of a bent <coughs> for collaboration, Moray is at home in translation and in the forms of creation that Marjorie Perloff calls unoriginal writing. Poetic strategies by highly original writers that stage the relationship between original and copy, variation, translation, adaptation. Moray's translations, her versions of Fernando Pessoa, for instance, for instance, are also excessive forms of translation. They're ludic in exercises, where an original triggers off variations. Stranded between times and memories, this fall summer between writing and translation, using the gap between languages as a space of creativity, and exploiting our particular Montreal affinity for the kinds of insights you can gain as you stumble on the uneven pavement of language in this city. The illuminations that come in the moment when you feel the ground shift and see things differently. I just wanted to mention that the, the cover image is by another Montreal artist, Edith Simon, sitting here. It's actually, this is the, the whole image. <coughs> so it's a, a kind of a collaborative Montreal sort of, of work. Thank you. Um, if there are questions <laughs> for anybody about anything. <laughs> I just, uh, uh, first of all, um, very nice presentation. I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I'm from Paraguay, actually. Ah. <laughs> and I just want to say that but, uh, the artist um, said that he wanted to express the meaning, the words, for, for people that walk by here in the downtown in front of the university. Well, actually, I was walking a few days back here and my eyes, among all the words, just read the words in Guarani. <laughs> and that's how I, because you just pass, it's like a long thing, a yellow long thing. And I was like, and then suddenly, why well, I know that word? <laughs> and, then, and then I started reading, and I'm like, what is this? 
<laughs> so that's, that's how I'm here. <laughs> so I, I have to say that you did a good job because either, I don't know, but I don't know how my eye just saw the words in Guarani because there are tons of them. The other thing, I have a one question for each of you, uh, for the artists. I want to know if you knew, because you talk about the typography of, your, of the letters, and I don't know if you know the Nyanduti thing that is talked in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. um, because your letters look like them. I don't know if it is a coincidence. Because uh, for the people here, Nyanduti, which is the word that I thought when I was walking, is a, it's a fabric, special fabric that has, a, it's like a spider web. And your letters are like this, like spider web. So the, the fabric is like a, a lace, right? It's yes. Like, yeah. So it's like, you do like a, a, you do like a fabric and the women usually do it. And they start doing like this, so it starts like, like a small thing and then grow like, like this. Does. So, but it, at the end, it looks like a spider web full of colors. <laughs> so when I saw the letters, I'm like, wow, they're really nice because they look like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to know if that it was like. Oh, well, I, I love to claim that that's a totally conscious and intentional <laughs> thing, but it is um, just a, <laughs> an intuitive thing that comes from reading the text and making a typeface that I think is appropriate. And if it does that, that's fantastic. Well, I think, and, and then. That's part of the. Yeah, and then when I posted, because I, I took some pictures and I posted on my Facebook, and my Paraguayan friends, some of them said, well, look at the letters. <laughs> they, they were really, really happy with the letters. <laughs> and then the question for the, for the translator. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know your, your challenges uh, with the Guarani language, and then if you, like, who helped you with the translation, how do you know which mean? I mean the... Well, I, I just used the where there was Guarani in the original text, I, I just kept it, and I just translated the dictionary, because even in Wilson's book, there's in, uh, in, in when it was published, in, it's been published in Brazil, in Argentina, in Mexico, um, it's, it has this dictionary, because even if people can uh, dissect oh, the okay. Spanish and the Portuguese, they need help with the Guarani. So I tried to correct it. There's still a couple of typos and errors, but I that it will be corrected in the next one. But I I I tried to make the dictionary more complete as well. But it's really beautiful. Like it, it's sort of funny the the effect of the spider because the the Nyanduti is um, important to Wilson's talking about or the character talks about. This is the way the she he figure who is the narrator tells a story. It's like making a spider web, and um, because. In for in, in Guarani, and then thus the echo for for somebody reading it in Portugal is it, it gives a very strong echo of the fabric, mm -hmm. of the idea of, of the of the fabric. Whereas if I say spider, because there's lots of the word spider and spider web in, in English in the book, um, it just says bugs to us. <laughs> like we don't get the idea of this this beautiful fabric or tissue, even if we might think spider webs are beautiful. It's mm -hmm. so that there's there's always kind of uh, those kinds of challenges where there's a, a register in the original language that a kind of resonance of a word that does not have the same resonance or that resonates something different. And sometimes when you translate, you just have to be glad that it doesn't that it doesn't resonate something awful. Um, like I, I always find it, I have trouble, um, some words I have trouble with, not in this book here, but in, in other books that give an example of that, is if you have to translate um, as cheeks, um, depending, especially in an experimental or in a strangely structured text, in English we have cheeks, cheeks. And so um, if you don't want to have this resonance of, of your cheeks, then you have to sometimes do something different when you're translating, you know? That's just one example of something where a resonance that you don't want could come into the text when you're just translating a word. But uh, anyways, that's, uh, you know, that, that's it. And I, I decided to keep the Guarani because um, with Mohawk, there's also, I think Mohawk is also an agglutinative language so that 
you can uh, things get added onto the words, but it doesn't have this effect that you need, to, to my knowledge, which is very small, of these words. The, the delightful thing is that this dog, for example, and with its little tail, that um, that the, with the Guarani, the longer the word gets, the smaller the thing is. There's these parts of the word that get added on to make it smaller and smaller, so that we have that in English in a sense of tiny and then teeny and then teensy weensy and teensy wincy itty bitty, you know. But there's, so that the, the more presence the word, this word has to describe the word tiny in the book, um, the more invisible is the thing that's actually being spoken of, which is Wilson killing himself laughing while he's writing his murder mystery. <laughs> anyway, that's just one of the interesting things about the book. Did you have a question for? <laughs> but, because I, I I arrived a little bit late. I just I just heard what you guys were yeah. having. Actually, I haven't noticed there was a third person here. <laughs> so. There we are. Anybody else have a comment question? Um, yeah, I um, um, as I'm a student here, and my I was born in Paraguay, and my mom's Paraguayan, so it's this thing. Ooh, we are two here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is thing of, like this is for me. Like, what's this is something that like doesn't come up a lot, <laughs> you know, in my daily life. So um, I was just curious because I I was thinking about it when I was walking the campus, and I'm like, I never really thought how many Paraguayans there must be in Montreal, but if there are Paraguayans in Montreal, surely they're like stopping in their tracks to look at this thing. So I was just curious if like you've heard people reaching out to you or if you've like shown this work or communicated with anyone like from that region who, just like what kind of responses there are, because I feel like there's a huge response. Like for me it was like, like not breathing for a second. Like, you know what I mean? It's like if someone, it's like if you're just walking and someone mentions like the name of the town you grew up, but or like the street you grew up or something. It's like, it's what's happening here, so. I don't know, I was just wondering if you've been getting responses from that and um, if you've shared uh, this work with anyone like in, in Paraguay or in that, uh, you know, those regions uh, where the countries come together. Well, I think it's wonderful just to be able to this group. <laughs> uh, there's three actually, because when we were installing, somebody came up and said, yeah, do you want, what is this word? Why is this word on this word? And so I was like, oh, that is, you, know, you are more numerous. <laughs> you are multiplying. When, when I was in high school, we had a model United Nations, and I was Paraguay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, so I had intimate knowledge. What I remember, though, is that it, was an extreme, it had a, a, a dictator, Strassler, for many, many years. And that would explain, in many ways, the persistence of, in a very strange way, he was able to kind of impose this memory, of this, this presence of Guarani. You know, like from the wrong, it was not a progressive thing, it was rather, or, or it was a progressive thing backwards in some way, um, that there is a very strong presence of Guarani in Paraguay as opposed to um, all the other countries in South America that have uh, uh, I've done so much work trying to eliminate the uh, indigenous languages, maybe. I can't, I mean, there's no indigenous language that gets to be totally a success story in the North or South America, but uh, but uh, Guarani is definitely very alive. I, I met uh, the, there's a Paraguayan poet, Susie Delgado. I don't know if you know her work. She pub she writes in um, in Guarani and translates herself into Spanish so that she'll publish her books bilingually. But I met her uh, at a conference on Wilson's work in, in Chile uh, a number of years ago. And um, after I did this thing in 2003 for the Oxford Book of Latin American Poetry, um, Wilson loved my translation and wanted me to translate the whole book. But I kept telling him I can't do it until I get a big block of time because it's too problematic trying to maintain uh, proper flow in the Portugal text. And so I didn't get to do it until I had a residency in 2013. And Wilson died in 2010. He was, uh, he was unfortunately murdered. And so 
I, I continued though to try and find time to work on a book in a way to fulfill my promise to him that, that I would uh, translate and publish the book. Um, but he, he must have known, he felt it was really important that the book be translated by me in Montreal. So he must have known that there's some, enough of Paraguay here in Montreal that, that makes this uh, an important thing. And one of the little essays in the book that's about the idea of the marafana floozy, the marafana actually, but I kept that word because the sounds of it and the different resonances of that word are important to the, the text. Um, said there's a little essay by a young poet Christian Kent who comes from SFGM. Um, and there's a whole troop of these young group of poets in Paraguay <coughs> call themselves Yopara. Yo, Yo. Yeah, Yopara is, is the mix of Spanish and Guarani. Yeah. That's actually, most of the people speak that. Uh, in Paraguay. Yeah, in Yo, Yopara. because uh, especially in the city, in Asuncion, Okay. Not everybody speak 100% Spanish and not everybody speak 100% Guarani. They speak like mixed. Mm -hmm. And some of them speak more Guarani than Spanish, some of them more Spanish than Guarani, but you always speak mixed, and that is Jopara. Jopara is, is the mixed. Okay. Yeah, he said it's so mixed. It's, or it's like Portuñol or Franglais, but it's. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's yeah, Spanish Guarani. That's what, okay. Because I, I called them the mixolated poets when I translated the word into mm -hmm. English, just because. With, for a Christian, it's uh, it's it's very it's very mixed up. But anyways, those young poets uh, who, who instead of writing, I guess in Spanish, write it in Yopara, um, are crazy about Wilson Bueno. So that uh, when I wanted to trap when I found Christian's uh, uh, essay and I wanted to translate it into uh, <coughs> into English for the book, he was super happy. It's a way. There's a, actually the, the, this book is probably sold more in among the young poets, it's just out a week or something, but they're all like, here, send us copies. <laughs> Everybody wants to see this book come out. But I think too, I mean, the, like Mo Mohawk, there's only about 600 fluent Mohawk speakers around, and I think also like me bothering the Language Institute to try to translate a few words into Mohawk um, was not one of their priorities. Um, and then I wasn't sure that it was it was all going to work. I tried to find another indigenous language, but and so I I sprung for a while on on Tsitsina, but it's an Athapascan language. It's not uh, and it's not agglutinative. It's tonal like Mandarin, so that wouldn't have worked for making these long itsy bitsy teensy weensy uh, words. So then I thought, well, I can't, I can't do that. There's out of that, there's only like about sixty fluent speakers left. So really trying to bother with them about this Brazilian book was a bit over the top. So in the, in the end, working through it, I, I decided a while, while I was doing it just to leave the Guarani and solve that problem later, and then I decided that it, Wilson is right, it's really important to keep the Guarani in the text. of danger, but it has this, for me, uh, taking this text, which is a very 
powerful and assertive text in a way, but putting it like a membrane on the outside of the building, you have to give it some tools to fight against the world of advertising and all the other ways that language is used as abu and abused in, in very um, you know, practical ways out there. And so giving it this typeface and giving it this assertive color. I mean, if you go into the pharmacy across the street, this text just, you know. So it's like giving it, giving it the weapons to play in that space is, I think, or, or the resources to play in that space is, is all that it is. Um, that's the choice. And it's the brightest color that I could get out of an inkjet printer. <laughs> it's the most assertive color. And, in terms of seeing it from a distance and seeing the contrast between the black and the yellow, there's this like you know practical graphic design sort of advertising thing like you want it to stand out. And uh, uh, yeah, and in, 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 in terms of the language, would every anybody? I mean, it's like that's the puzzle, right? Or that's the you know you're supposed to read it and get the story and get the narrative from the beginning to the end, but it's impossible to do that and taking it out of the form of the book or taking it off the screen and putting it out there. That way it, it, it befuddles that possibility of reading linearly through the text. And I think that's great. And you don't know how long this text is going to be there every time you come to work and come through the door and see those 18 words that are right beside the door as you come in. But that's the way this text should be read. And then if you come in the other door or whatever, then there's, there's a way of, of having the text or having the meaning created by this text in that kind of drilling into the text way, right? Or the, the repetition of coming to work every day and coming to this building every day and seeing those 18 words and going, oh, I should come in a different door <laughs> now because then I'll get another part of the text or I should, whatever, scoot around and walk around the building. I mean, my favorite part of this piece is the part that wraps around into the, into the loading dock. And I really like how it, it pulls people the side, the back, into the kind of underwear of the building. <laughs> That's really exciting. <laughs> How long will it be there? Um, uh, officially till the winter break. Which is? December. It's, it's announced on December 7th. Yeah. Hmm. They probably won't tear it off. But that, that one side that wraps around on the loading dock, I don't see why that shouldn't be there, you know, forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a pri private opinion. <laughs> <laughs> talking about that today, Jennifer and I, it, you know, there's a couple of little spots where there's little alcoves where, you know, where people have uh, picked off corners and stuff, but really, no, not at all. I don't know, and, and sort of, in a way, welcome that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's there, it's in public space. I mean, you can't control what's going to happen, but uh, not really. There's a couple of little spots where people, you know, we have, and we haven't been, I, that I know of, we haven't been policing and cleaning or anything like that. It's just, it is the way it is, and it is weathering the way it will weather. <coughs> yeah. Almost like hanging around with the birds. I don't know. Aaron, you, you mentioned that, because I've only started reading it, I've read it like four pages. And I read the excerpts that I found online, extracts. Right. Um, you mentioned within the text itself there are references to other works by Brazilian writers and, 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 Spanish, and Spanish language learner. Can language. you place his work within that context? Um, no, not really. I, th I think that I mean I, I would to do that. I would uh, I would have to to. You know, quote you Katrina Dodson's words, who's a translator of all of the most recent collective stories of Clarice Elizabeth Dorn. Um, anyway, she names some of the Brazilian, uh, she, she lived in Brazil for about six years, I think, and she, she, she named 
On her little blurb here, she says, the feverish ramblings of Buenos Marafana Fluzi recall the dark deliriums of Hilda Hilst and uh, Joao Gilberto Nol and the mixed blood trickster humor of Mario de Andrade. Erin Moore, uh, yeah, so she names a few of the Brazilian writers where she sees a, a resemblance. My, my knowledge of, of Brazilian writing in general is just derived from uh, different, very jumpy sorts of contact, tech, contacts. I don't have uh, uh, working with people, uh, working with translators and things like that. And I ended up translating from Brasileiro because I translate from Galician. But really, so really, my my literary knowledge is of of Galicia. And it's it's fun actually to talk about. Oh right, that he's influenced by it, which can, can are from world yeah. literature. This is Wilson's here. I'll name randomly. Yeah, um, I'll name randomly in no particular order: Clarice Lispector, Guimarães Rosa, Franz Kafka, Machado de Assis, Borges, Joyce, Cortázar, Cortázar, Cortázar. <laughs> as well as Hemingway, Gide, Shakespeare, Calvino, and Calvino, and Calvino, <laughs> our master. And then there's all that rotten, perfidious, and amazing Argentinian literature, from Ma Madaviaga to Lamborghini, from Cesar Aira to Nestor Perover, and my Brazilian contemporaries, Noam, Bernardo Carvalho, Nassar, Hatton, princes of Brazilian prose. So he, he named some more people who've Who've, who've influenced him. I mean, basically, I've just ended up going uh, to Brazil a couple of times because he went around after Wilson managed to extract from me in 2003 a promise that I would translate the book. He went around and told everybody, oh, Aaron Moore is translating by Paraguay and C. So I get all these, you know, people write me in the back channel on Facebook going, when is it? Where is it? Where's the book? And I'd be like, uh. <laughs> so it's been going on for a long time. I just wanted to say when you read it, it was like the most beautiful thing. I don't want to read it. I want to hear you. <laughs> yes. It was so unpredictable when your French words came. And I was thinking that when you wrote it, you must have wrote it out loud. Mm -hmm. like, and the opposite of how you write it. You oh. can write like, out loud in yeah, the books. Well, I think because because I read it like that, I one one translates the way one reads. If if you are a stiff reader, you'll create a stiff translation. Um, but I I mean I tried to get into what the text is doing, and for me there was a real flow in that text. I mean the text does just doesn't stop; it goes on and on. It's like a river, and it's um, it, so it was to try to kind of uh, create. A soundscape in using English and French that's similar to a reader here as the soundscape of Portugal of a mixed language is for somebody in Brazil or Argentina or somewhere like that, and and uh, play it up too because of course Wilson you know turns it up a bit, turns up the volume on it a bit, but uh, it's a uh, I just uh, yeah. Just trying to do that, but definitely I, I I didn't read very much out actually out loud though, and I found it when I now when I read it I'm getting I just read it from it a couple of times, but I'm getting all kinds of delights because uh, the muscles of your mouth move differently when you speak different languages, and so if and it has to do not just with the muscles of your mouth but with where your brain where your what language that your neurons are in, like I used to have fun sometimes if I had to make a little speech or something, I would write it in Gallego and then read it in English. Like I would just extemporaneously translate it. And but when my brain is reading in Gallego and I sound when I'm speaking English like a Galician trying to speak English. <laughs> um, and it's with this too I'll start and I, I start to read and say French words. Sometimes when I go back to the English words I sound like a, a crazy Appreciate Francophone who can't pronounce English uh, very well. So it's kind of fun because this whole this is kind of a Paraguay and sea happens in my mouth. <laughs> Would you consider, 
consider it? Recording. Doing a long recording. Well, maybe I will sometime. There's a there's um, actually if you look on uh, on Pen Sound on the Pen Sound is um, a sound archive of, uh, of American poetry and some Canadian as well. So that there's a, I have a, there's a page of various readings of mine. There's an Aaron Moray page. So if you go find Pen Sound and then find Aaron Moray, there's um, the reading that I did, which was a bit longer, maybe 20 minutes from this book uh, in. Uh, in Brooklyn, a couple of weeks ago, is uh, is up there. It was recorded so that you could could hear me trying to read more of it. I just want to add. I think that would be a lovely idea if you did actually have a, um, an oral uh, reading of it that we could access. Because I know there's some writers that it's really when they read it uh -huh. that it's at, at its richest. I don't know. And now you've translated it. I think I would just love that. Well, I'm, it's, I'll, it's, 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 it's as you say, it's an archive. It's it's a way. It's a one interpretation of this. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I think you really should do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think um, people here would help if you needed that. I think yeah. it would just be invaluable. Well, I think here too, like our um, at Concordia, uh, Jason Townlon in the English department is working with sound archives, working with the sound archives of poetry readings that already exist through all the year. They're they're working with right. the, through the historical things that they have. But maybe I could. Uh, if I talk to him to see if there's yeah. a way of, they must, they've got equipment and things, maybe there's a way of recording yeah. some more of it. And people can do it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. Actually, there's a really interesting precedent for that. Um, e. M. Klein's um, bilingual poem on Montreal is very much constructed on the same principles of using English words that have a French resonance. Yeah. Or that have yeah. a, so it's, a, it's very much the same thing. But in fact, the way you pronounce it is going to be very different. I mean, you can read it and write it, and it'll have kind of one resonance, which won't be quite the same. When you read it and you Frenchify it, you've, you, you're kind of, um, you're pushing it in, in a direction that you don't necessarily get when you're reading it. So it's, it's really two different readings, I think. Um, but it'll be interesting to read next to his bilingual poem on Montreal, where he, where he does exactly the same thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, it's fun. I love this. I love the book, and I've really, I love the book, and I've really enjoyed translating it. And, and uh, now that uh, now that I've done it, I can. I don't know. I, I'm interested in hearing, you know, what some of the responses are going to be. And but that, as I say, recording some more of it would be fun. It would be fun for sure. We have snacks, and <laughs> we, we would invite you to, uh, to join us for some snacks and things to drink. And just to tell you that Paraguay and Sea by Wilson Bueno, translated by Aaron Moray, is, is available at the, at the front desk, okay. and along with some other books of Aaron. So if you want to just have a look at it, or if you like it, I want to Thank you. Oh.